regions to respond appropriately to whatever threat there is to Canadians and uh, obviously other uh, embassies and so on in Canada. Alain Laforêt, TQS. When did you decide to increase the security at the at the borders and to close the airports? First of all, it was the GRCMP that decided to close down the airports. Did you consult them? There is a crisis committee. Was that where the decision? I didn't think too long. We responded as soon as we got the information as to what happened. We met, of course. And as you can imagine, we spent the whole day together. And we were going to to continue to, continue to be together, to ensure, to ensure that we can continue to assess the threat to the best of our ability and to respond to it. When do you think that will Canadian airports be open to air traffic again? At the moment, I'm in, no, not, a, not in a position to, to respond to that because it's not up to the RCMP to make that decision. When we're sure that aircraft can land at airports and Take off. I'm sure that airports will be reopened. Mark Dunn, Sun Media. Yeah, hi, Commissioner. Could, could you explain to Canadians just like what level of security are we at right now? Are we at the highest? Are we in the middle? Are we three quarters? And could you maybe explain the different natures of, of security levels? And are there nicknames like Operation Red Leaf here in the Ottawa area? Or uh, we don't have nicknames for security. As I said before, what we do is we evaluate the threat. Uh, based on the very best intelligence that we gather, obviously, in Canada and from around the world with our allies, and then provide the security that best responds to that. Obviously, uh, in the United States, they are in a much more heightened uh, alert than uh, than we would be, but we are very cautious and concerned about the, the implications and the connection there. So it's the threat that determines the the level of response and that's how we do so obviously it moves up it moves up the uh, the the scale but it's at the end of the day it is an evaluation that is done by by people sit around and we make the best decision on how, what's the best way to how respond how serious is the threat and just what level of security are we at well we are we are at a heightened state uh, we are at an alert state we are we are concerned about the situation although we have no direct threat uh, in this country we are very much concerned because as i said terrorism is an international issue. So when something happens close to us, we obviously take that into consideration and evaluate the threat and respond accordingly, as we have done in terms of providing uh, a certain heightened protection for certain places in this country, especially in this, in this city. Uh, excuse me, Mark, I have to go on. Sorry. Uh, Elizabeth Thompson, the Gazette. To follow up on his, on his question there, um, I wonder if you could t t uh, talk a little bit about what kind of a scale you use to assess threats, where we are on that scale, and if you could tell Canadians in one sentence, what is your assessment of the threat that uh, Canada faces at this point? Well, uh, as I said, uh, obviously we, we evaluate the threat and we respond accordingly. We are not uh, at, the, at one end of the extreme spectrum in this country, but we are in a situation where we are evaluating something uh, horrendous that happened very close to us, and that's what we're doing. So we're responding accordingly. And as we evaluate that, as we get any possible information, we will reevaluate. This is something that is done on a minute-by-minute minute, minute minute basis. Obviously, you will see more, more police cars around Parliament Hill, you will see more uh, more work being done in that whole security area in other parts of the country, depending on who needs that that uh, that heightened protection. That's what we do. Do you, that you would use for within your organization would have how many levels, and what level would we be at right now? Uh, well, in in, in Canada, uh, security is not something you check off on a box. It is something that requires uh, a subjective analysis by people who are best informed of the situation, and we move that up and down the scale. I have Ju Julie. I'm sorry. I have. Where are we on the scale? Uh, well, as I said, we are very aware that something terrible has happened next to us. We have instituted a number of measures to protect the citizens of this country, certain institutions, certain buildings, and certain people that are potentially at higher risk. That's what we have done. Obviously, places like the American Embassy and so on, personnel from other embassies, that's what we look at. Who is potentially at risk in this situation, and we respond accordingly. Julie Van Dusen, CBC. 
How do you suppose people could get through airports with weapons to hijack planes? And do you imagine uh, we're as vulnerable here? Well, obviously, we're, we're all vulnerable. I mean, uh, terrorism is a, is a global menace. Uh, we are all vulnerable. I don't, uh, obviously, at this point, know how exactly this happened. I don't know if anybody does know that. But that, obviously, the investigation and uh, the work that will be done by all the, uh, all the democratic uh, allies in, in the world will try to determine that, obviously. And, but how that happens, we don't know yet. And uh, it, can it happen elsewhere? Yes, that's why we try to have the very best intelligence. That's why we try to integrate our resources as much as we can in collaborative efforts with our allies, other police forces and agencies in this country, and try to reduce that threat. That threat is always there. It moves up and down depending on what happens. But it's there, and what we, what we have to ensure is that we are the best intelligence-led organization we can be, integrate that intelligence that minimizes the risk of that threat. Marco Vazzi, excuse me, Julie, you have to add I still have five people on my list, and we have five minutes left. left. Uh, Marco Fortier, Journal de Montréal. Um, according to CSIS, Canada was very, very vulnerable to a terrorist attack as the main ally of the U.S. This morning, when you saw that on television, did you think that Canada could have become a target for terrorist attack at that time. The possibility is always there that Canada, like other countries, could be a target. That's always been a fact. But what we saw this morning was that uh, this could happen. It happened in the United States. We are vulnerable. It is possible that an incident such as that could happen in Canada, but there is no indication, there is no intelligence to the effect that Canada is a target. Did you think of invoking the War Measures Act? No, not at all. What would it take to do that? Well, there is an act. There's no question of invoking that act. As I said, there is no indication to the effect that Canada is a target. We have to remember that. Rick it's important to remember that. I, I think you've, you've just answered my question. Oh, then I have gentlemen next, uh, gentlemen next to you, and sir. John Gattis from McLean's. Thank you. Commissioner, how would you assess the level of activity by groups in Canada with links to international terrorism today compared to where it was back when the uh, Madras Sam case made us all aware of those kind of linkages uh, back at the turn of the last year? Well, that, that's a difficult question to answer, but obviously the possibility is always there. Uh, that exists. We know there are certain organizations that that do uh, that do exist around the world that uh, are committed to certain uh, to certain types of behavior. That exists. Uh, how much that has changed? Uh, that is a very difficult uh, thing to to gauge. The the important thing is we have to be vigilant against the, that type of activity and try to minimize or eliminate the possibility of those types of acts taking place by those types of groups and intelligence and being able to. To respond in a coordinated way is the best way to to minimize the impact of, uh, of the. Make it harder for those groups to operate here. Uh, we try to make it harder. We try to we try to make it harder. We change some of our laws. We try <coughs> to get better in terms of gathering intelligence. We try to become much more integrated, not only in Canada but on a worldwide basis. I think we improve our intelligence capacity every day. I think we we improve our integration and sharing of intelligence on a worldwide basis every day. I think we learned a lot from the Rassam case. We did learn. We did take. Some of the lessons learned from there and have improved some of our processes. You, Windsor, Globe and Mail. Uh, uh, Commissioner, have you recommended that the Prime Minister stay in 24 Sussex and work out of there uh, rather than is it because he's easier to protect there than if he'd gone to Halifax or whatever? Uh, I uh, Mr. Windsor, I, I can't get into the details of, uh, of the specifics of uh, what type of advice we offer the Prime Minister, but obviously we're very concerned about that and his security. And again, we evaluate the threat and the possible threats, and then we will make the appropriate recommendations uh, to him and his staff in terms of what's the best way to deal with his security. Stephen Thorne, CP. Have you had any uh, intelligence information in recent days or weeks that might have uh, uh, heightened your awareness that something may happen? Uh, that that is something that I that I can't uh, speak to. Obviously, the the sensitivity of that uh, of that type of thing I can't respond to. Uh, ceci complète le premier tour de questions.
Let's complete the first round of questions. And the 20 minutes that we had, there are still six people who would like to ask questions. Would you agree to stay a few minutes longer? Yes, of course. I'll stay a few minutes longer. So the, I would ask the six people to please be very brief. And we have five minutes, so please be very brief. First, I have a Ms. Aslan, given the scope of this attack in the U.S., do we need to review the possibility, as Mr. Klein was saying, to cancel an event scheduled for next year? As I said the other day when you were there, it was the Prime Minister and the government that will decide whether there will be a, a conference or not. I, made certain recommend I will make my recommendations. I think that uh, elected people in democratic countries should never hide. They should meet when they think it is appropriate to meet. Manon Le you said that we're in an alert state. Does that mean that we're in a high state of alert in French? And what is it? Is it because we fear that there are real threats for Canada, or what? What does this mean? Well, if I can answer, what I said was that we have evaluated the threat, and in light of the threat, we had taken certain steps. That's what I said. I did not say that there is a high, a high level of security. We, we, we looked at the threat of what happened in the States. We provided more security in certain places, consulates and embassies here in Ottawa, for instance, and in other cities, in Toronto and Montreal, for instance. That's All right, Commissioner uh, Giuliano Zaccadelli speaking in Ottawa, going through the uh, fact that the, throughout this day, Canadian security officials have been evaluating threats and been reacting to them, and clearly there are security measures being taken all across this nation and especially in the nation's capital. Now switching to Israel, Ariel Sharon, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, speaking on this same subject. Let's hear what he has to say. We seek to destroy our liberty and our way of life. I believe that together we can defeat these forces of evil. In this most difficult hour, all Israelis stand as one with the American people. Our hearts are with you, and we are ready to provide any assistance at any time. The government of Israel has declared a day of mourning tomorrow as we bow our heads and share in the sorrow of the American people. Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon uh, calling for a day of national mourning in Israel tomorrow and uh, his uh, disgust and horror as to what has happened in the United States today. Our correspondent in the Middle East is Neil McDonald, who has been monitoring uh, the reaction of Israelis today. Uh, Neil, what can you tell us? Well, Peter, as you heard from Ariel Sharon, a feeling of profound empathy, I think, amongst Israelis uh, for what happened. Uh, mixed, I think, and not to detract from that sorrow or that sympathy with a sort of a sense of grim satisfaction that, uh, that the world is, is fighting the same enemy that, that Israelis have been fighting for a long time. Former Prime Minister Benjamin Net Netanyahu said as much just a little while ago, saying that Israelis have been in the front line for a long time, and this is a battle between the forces of, of democracy and, and, uh, and, and the forces of, of evil and totalitarianism. I think it's that, that's representative of what a fair number of people here think. On the other side of the coin, Arab leaders being very, very cautious today. Yasser Arafat, is, uh, as we've heard throughout the day, expressing condolences and some shock at this. Uh, but I should say that there is a disconnect, uh, to say the least, between the Arab leadership and the Arab street. Uh, you know, for, uh, for the last year or so, uh, in the minds of many Arabs, here in the Palestinian territories and as well throughout the Arab world, <clears throat> Israel and the United States have fused into a synonym uh, and, and are regarded by, by many Arabs as... as uh, enemy countries and uh, there will be people that are happy uh, that that someone has been able to strike a blow at Israel's greatest friend and protector we saw scenes today 
in Jerusalem, in the West Bank, and in Lebanon of Palestinians dancing and celebrating this. And, and those scenes will inevitably be replayed. And I think a lot of Arabs tonight are probably worried about <clears throat> a redrawing of the lines of this thing, a shifting of geopolitical lines, and uh, with them cast heretofore as terrorists, uh, and uh, the word Islam synonymous with atrocity in the Western mind. All right, and Neil, when we talked uh, a couple of hours ago, um, when we were going through the list of, uh, of who perhaps was capable of uh, conducting something like this, uh, Osama bin Laden's name was mentioned. You cautioned us, uh, uh, as others have as well, as to be uh, careful here. There's no proof of anything yet. Uh, but since that last conversation, we've had uh, a number of uh, American agencies uh, reporting that name as well, using unnamed sources in the uh, U.S. administration, <coughs> suggesting that there are uh, suggestions here of fingerprints of bin Laden on this one, uh, and that to expect uh, action uh, and retaliation uh, soon. Still no public confirmation uh, by any stretch of the imagination of anything like that. Uh, has there been more discussion about the Osama bin Laden possibility uh, in your part of the world in the last couple of hours? Counterterrorism experts here, Peter, and there are very well-informed counterterrorism experts, have been saying here for the last couple of hours that this bears the fingerprints of an extremely organized organization on a state level uh, and someone who has done this before. Uh, Israeli experts are naming bin Laden or the state of Iraq. The latter would be terribly bad news here uh, because of uh, Iraq's proximity to Israel and because it would just, it would change the way people live here if Iraq had done something like this. But uh, bin Laden and, uh, and the Iraqis have been named. It's uh, generally assumed. Uh, the, the defense minister here talked about the number one enemy in the world now is Islamic terror and the world should understand that. The foreign minister, Shimon Peres, said something the same. A general went on television tonight, an Israeli general, and called for the liquidation of Yasser Arafat. Certainly a hardening of attitudes, but it's taken for granted here that this was uh, what Israelis call an Islamic terror attack and that the rest of the world should now join with them and organize against that. Uh, there haven't been many suggestions as to just how that should be done, uh, but certainly in this part of the world, uh, movements, military movements, uh, shifting political tensions, as I said, shifting geopolitical lines make everyone nervous. As Israel is inevitably drawn into this equation uh, because if it was, uh, uh, if it was, if there was an Arab angle here, and I say if, uh, then it will be done in the name of uh, striking back, uh, striking a blow for the Palestinians and, and uh, the United States' uh, alliance and, and, and protectorship of Israel. So no one quite knows how life is going to change, but I think it's probably fair to say that most people here, Arab and Jew, feel that life has changed. Uh, and as I said earlier, with the Arabs of the Middle East, doubtless hoping uh, that uh, it doesn't reach a situation where they are from now on seen as the terrorists uh, and the bad guys, and uh, that, what, that their, uh, let's say, historic aspirations will have been wiped out uh, in the course of one day. All right, Neil, we're going to have to leave it there because we're going to lose our satellite connection with you. We'll be talking to you later on throughout the evening. Uh, our Neil McDonald reporting to us uh, tonight, uh, Israeli time from uh, Jerusalem. Well, let's try to uh, bring this all together as we've reached the uh, supper hour in Atlantic Canada, and uh, normally you would be expecting your supper hour newscast, Canada Now, uh, but we are obviously on a full network uh, alert here and have been for uh, countless hours now, and we'll continue throughout uh, this evening and well into uh, uh, tomorrow morning uh, as well as we continue to monitor this story. Uh, what happened here, if you've uh, been totally uh, away from any communications uh, facilities in the last eight and a half hours, then you don't know. Uh, what happened was two aircraft hijacked in the United States slamming into the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers, uh, just before 9 o'clock and just after 9 o'clock this morning, New York time. Within 90 minutes, both towers lay in rubbles on the ground. Those towers, 110 to 120 stories high, normally house as many as 50,000 people on a normal working day. How many were in the building at the time, we do not know. How many managed to escape, we do not know. Uh, still, rescue officials in New York have been unable to get to the scene of the rubble uh, for fear of the dangers that uh, are exposed there. Fire, gas leaks, uh, there are surrounding buildings that are still uh, in flames and teetering on the brink of collapse as well. Two other hijacked aircraft, one slamming into the Pentagon building in Washington. There have been countless uh, casualties there as well, some suggesting 
leaving at least 100 dead. Once again, the major destruction in New York City. Of that, there is no doubt. A fourth aircraft was hijacked as well. It slammed into the ground in Pennsylvania. Early indications are that it was heading towards Camp David, the U.S. presidential retreat. The President of the United States was in Florida when this happened early this morning. Uh, he then went to Louisiana, then to Omaha, is now on his way back to the U.S. Capitol in Washington, where he will speak to the nation later tonight. A firm time on that is not known, but one assumes it'll be about 9 o'clock this evening. There has been no full disclosure yet from the U.S. government as to what they know, only the uh, uh, actions and the condemnation uh, of the actions that have taken place, and that a promise that there will be a response. Response. Uh, in Canada, airports are uh, covered on tarmacs from coast to coast to coast with aircraft that have been diverted uh, to Canada because they were not allowed to land in the United States. Right now, the whole North American airspace is a no-fly zone as uh, aircraft have been grounded and they won't be up in the air uh, before uh, noon hour tomorrow at the earliest. Uh, still, the full implications of what's happened are still being considered and sifted through. Now we're going to try and uh, walk you through some of the things that have happened uh, through today in terms of uh, visual reports and let's start off uh, with the first of those reports from Adrian Arsenault in Washington. Here's Adrian. Good morning. You're looking at live pictures of the World Trade Center Tower. The tragedy started with the workday. At 8.45 a.m. a hijacked American Airlines jet crashes into one of the twin towers at the World Trade Center. Of New York's World Trade An office Center. complex the size of some small cities suddenly in flames. We heard the crash, we ran to the window. The building. It went into the Trade and Center. We the trade Center, we, we saw the shrapnel fall. Then, incredibly, at 9.03, another hijacked American Airlines flight at the right of the screen did the unthinkable. Oh, my goodness. Oh, God. Straight there's through another. the second tower. This was no accident. Oh, my goodness, there's another this one. This seems to be on purpose. 53. Within moments, the horrors were laid to the president. He was supposed to be addressing school children. Instead, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Catastrophe enough, but it was about to get so much worse. At 9.45, word of an explosion at the Pentagon. Yet another jumbo jet, believed to be a hijacked United Airlines flight, crashes into the west wing of the military headquarters of the United States. It then collapses. Credible threats of more disasters ahead forced the evacuation of the White House, the Capitol, the State Department. Every federal building in Washington emptied out. This is a federal building here, all right? Think about it. You're not safe here. Buildings across the United States of any significance closed, as was the border. And for the first time ever, every plane in the United States was grounded immediately. Flights into the U.S. diverted to Canada because death was clearly delivered from the skies today. Back in New York at 10 o'clock, as some of the desperate World Trade Center workers angle for air and hope of rescue, one of the twin towers simply succumbs. At 10.29, the second tower goes. A hundred and ten stories each. Tens of thousands of people worked here. <laughs> 10,000 more were trying to help rescue them, just as the most famous office complex in the world simply disappeared from the New York skyline. The president, en route to an unknown location, had to speak again. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Safety here could no longer be taken for granted, the terror still roaring throughout the United States. Amid the panic in New York and Washington, word that a fourth commercial airliner had been hijacked. A flight from Newark to San Francisco. Just outside Pittsburgh, it crashed into a cornfield. Four downed planes, office buildings destroyed. No one yet able to even start counting the casualties. Not a moment to pause and reflect. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Washington. 
And the situation doesn't get any better in New York at this hour. As we go live now, uh, pictures once again. Another building has uh, collapsed right uh, as we were watching Adrian's report. One of the uh, uh, buildings next to the area where the World uh, Trade Center towers were. It has been under threat all day today from structural damage caused by the uh, debris that fell from the World Trade Center. Uh, we are told now it has collapsed as well. That was expected for the last couple of hours. There were fears and concerns that that building too would collapse. Once again, there is no sense, no estimation right now in terms of casualties in that immediate area. It is expected the death toll is going to be massive. It is known that in New York hospitals, more than 2,000 people have been treated uh, for wounds associated with this incident, but those were mostly walking wounded, people who were not in the immediate area, but in the nearby area and were affected by falling debris. Uh, they have been taken to hospitals, uh, more than 2,000 of them. In Washington, we're told uh, over 100 uh, people may have died in the Pentagon building. Now, the reaction to all this through today, the after effects of it, as Adrian hinted, much of it spilling over to Canada as many flights were diverted from the United States because they were not allowed to land in airports there. They were allowed to land in airports right across this country. Ron Charles has been following the Canadian side of the story. With no commercial aircraft allowed over the U.S., planes that had been on their way there from overseas are being diverted to airports in Canada. That means finding room for up to 500 unexpected aircraft. Airlines in Canada cancelled their flights and parked their planes to free up space. We have closed, effectively closed Pearson Airport to uh, normal operations at this point. So scheduled flights um, in and out of the airport effectively have not been happening today and will not likely happen for the rest of the day. Our Toronto's Pearson Airport plans to accept about 25 diverted planes. The airport in Halifax was prepared for 50. Security was extremely tight. In Halifax, the planes that had been bound for the U.S. were lined up on a closed runway while the RCMP performed a security sweep of each aircraft. The passengers spent hours waiting to get off the planes. And we were going to San Francisco, but unfortunately we've come to Calgary instead. The cancellation of flights across North America left thousands of travelers stranded at Canadian airports, and the events in the U.S. left them stunned. Total shock and disbelief sounds like something out of a movie. It's unbelievable until I still, until I see that on the news, it hasn't hit, I, I, I just can't believe it, I, I just, it's not real. I think it's a disgrace and I think President Bush should act immediately without hesitation of the Pentagon and nuke every terrorist state in the world. Air Canada announced that the hijacked plane that crashed outside Pittsburgh was a flight the airline shares with United Airlines. But Air Canada officials say they have no record of any of their passengers on board the plane. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Well, as Ron reported, uh, airports across this country affected by this. Let's go out to St. John's, where Linda Calvert was reporting earlier today from St. John's Airport. She's now uh, near one of the stadiums that I guess is now suddenly the temporary home for some of these passengers who have been diverted. Linda? Well, they aren't here yet, Peter. In fact, they're still out at the airport, but the airport has been shut down. Officials shut it down about an hour ago. There are 27 wide-bodied jets out there, and that's as many as they can handle. In fact, they're at about double capacity with that. So they will be redirecting all flights from St. John's to either Gander or Stephenville, which is a small town on the, on the west coast. All told, provincial government officials say they're expecting between 10 to 15,000 passengers from redirected flights here uh, in Newfoundland sometime this evening. And we were talking about the people in St. John's. City of St. John's officials say about five to 6,000 of them are here. They're sitting on the tarmac out at St. John's Airport, but they will be let go soon from those airplanes. That's what officials are saying. And their first stop will be here, which is where I'm standing. This is Mile One Stadium. It's a large stadium in downtown St. John's. And uh, here, they're going to do some paperwork with them. They're going to feed them, and they're going to try and coordinate the accommodations. And that, Peter, could be the biggest headache that city officials face because, as the mayor of St. John's said, there are only about 1,000 hotel rooms here. Many of them are booked. This is tourist season. And so they're asking anybody, they're asking uh, churches, schools, the convention center, even private citizens to open up their floor space for these people to have somewhere to sleep. Well, knowing the people of uh, St. John's and the area immediately around the Newfoundland capital, I'm sure that's, uh, that's not going to be a problem. It'll be at least tonight, though, uh, where these people are going to have to uh, find uh, housing and uh, a roof to cover their heads uh, for at least one night. 
at least tonight, and it may even be on the planes. We're told by officials that it may, may take them, well, there's 27 planes out there. It may take them to, to at least 6 o'clock this morning to process the last people out at the airport. All right, Linda Calvert uh, reporting from St. John's, Newfoundland for us tonight. A little uh, further update, if we can look at those pictures from New York City once again, the live shot. Uh, that third building, we're now told, was 47 stories uh, tall. The World Trade Center, remember, was 110, but 47 stories tall. Even though it has been vulnerable all afternoon, concern about it being expressed, uh, we are told um, that there were police officers and firefighters in the immediate area and uh, once again as we found out with the destruction of the uh, Twin Towers there are police officers and firefighters who are working in that immediate area who are missing at this hour. Incredibly tragic story that continues to unfold in that American city. Uh, throughout uh, this nation and throughout the world anyone who uh, works in a uh, office tower, a high-rise tower of any kind, must have looked at those pictures with extreme shock and horror and tried to imagine what it must have been like. Here in Toronto, John Northcott has been talking to people who work in buildings like that today. American tourists came to see the CN Tower. Instead, they worked their cell phones to hear of the tragedy back home. I just can't believe it. It's devastating. My, my heart's in my, my throat right now. It's, just, it's an amazing thing. I can now understand how Pearl Harbor felt when they were bombing that area down here. It's a definite act of treason, and I hope the president now finds out who's taken responsibility for this and nailed them. Officials weren't ordered to close the tower, but decided to do so out of respect for the victims of the attack. Yes, sir, Bud Purvis is the president of the CN Tower. Uh, we've talked to the RSMP, we've talked to the Toronto Police, I've also talked to the aviation control people. There seems to be a feeling that this is not about Canada. But still, the effect was felt. Several downtown office towers were closed, and by mid-morning, many other Torontonians left work for the day, clogging downtown streets. I was quite shocked. I have a niece who uh, just moved to New York City for her schooling and uh, she moved right downtown I think so she's, she's there so I'll be phoning family when I get home to find out if she's okay. Pearson International Airport suspended normal operations and was under tight security. Peter Gregg of the Greater Toronto Airport Authority. Um, we have closed, effectively closed Pearson Airport to uh, normal operations at this point. So scheduled flights um, in and out of the airport effectively have not been happening today and will not likely happen for the rest of the day. Our priority has been to receive diverted flights that were bound to uh, destinations within the U.S. Reaction from Ontario's Premier Mike Harris. Their loss, their pain, their sorrow is shared by every human being everywhere. Toronto's mayor, Mel Lastman. Because there's no fear in Toronto, but it is something that's touched everybody in this city, and everybody is sick at what happened at this cowardly, horrible act. Lastman is asking Torontonians to open their homes to travelers who are unable to return home. The city's emergency service personnel are on heightened alert, ready to be sent south of the border to spell off American services drained by the attack of the terrorists. These people may think they're going to heaven, but I think they're going straight to hell. John Northcott, CBC News, Toronto. Also uh, prepared to head south of the border, Canadian blood being donated from one end of this country to the other after a call from the Canadian Blood Services. They haven't been asked directly yet, or at least they hadn't been a couple of hours ago, for blood to be sent to New York and to Washington, but they are expecting a call like that as there are uh, low blood supplies in both those cities. Uh, Canadian uh, uh, donations have been uh, happening all day today. Uh, right now, Daryl McIntyre has been monitoring the situation uh, here in Toronto. People started showing up here at the blood clinic in Vancouver early this morning. In fact, there were some here as early as 8 o'clock. And that's hours before the clinic even was supposed to open. I feel sick about what happened in the States this morning, and I just can't sit at home and watch TV. I, I usually come in anyway, um, and in fact, I was coming tonight, but uh, after hearing about this, I thought, eh, I'd better get in here a little sooner, so that's why I came earlier. 
Now, staff here have been scrambling to try and meet the, the demand or the, the desire for people to donate blood. They did open the clinic early. They started taking uh, blood donations early. They're also going to extend the hours of the clinic, not just today, but for the next couple of days. Today, we've, ha we've had an unbelievable response from our donors um, to the current disaster that's happening in the U.S., and they're, they're wanting to help in any way that they can. There will be the need for blood over the next eight weeks. Managers are scrambling to get as many staff members in here to work as they possibly can to meet the demand. And also, they're asking donors to call ahead. To call your local clinic if you want to uh, donate blood today uh, and try and make an appointment. They say that'll do a couple of things. Uh, first of all, it'll avoid you having to wait in the long lineups that are developing at blood clinics right across the country. And also, it'll allow them to manage the supply uh, a little bit better. They say they don't want everybody showing up today and nobody showing up tomorrow or the next day. Canadian Blood Services says in the wake of this tragedy in the United States they will probably have a huge demand for uh, blood for weeks to come. Daryl McIntyre, CBC News, Vancouver. All right, thank you very much, Daryl. Let's go up to the nation's capital in Ottawa, where the CBC senior parliamentary editor, Don Newman, has been monitoring the Canadian government's reaction throughout today, watching the Prime Minister and uh, just moments ago, the RCMP Commissioner, Giuliano Zaccadelli. Don. Well, Peter, I guess the headline out of the uh, Commissioner's news conference and uh, the thing that Canadians were wanting to hear, the Commissioner said there is no indication, there is no intelligence that Canada is a target. Having said that, though, he said there has been heightened security, particularly around embassies and consulates, around airports, and around other unspecified uh, government buildings. The Prime Minister was just finishing a breakfast this morning with Saskatchewan Premier Lauren Calvert, saying goodbye to the Premier at 24 Sussex Drive, the Prime Minister's residence, uh, when someone said to him, uh, Prime Minister, there's been a plane crash in New York, there's something on the television. Uh, the Prime Minister went and turned on the TV to find out that there was not just one plane crash, but two. Uh, he then got on the phone, started talking to Commissioner Zaccadelli, uh, talked to the head of CSIS, uh, Ward Alcock. He talked to uh, Ray Hayno, the chief of the defense staff, and talked to, uh, of course, the senior officials in his office as they tried to determine exactly what was going on. Uh, the Prime Minister then, at about 11.30 this morning, Ottawa time, issued a statement expressing condolences to the Americans and outrage at the attack by... Uh, whomever uh, launched this attack on the uh, World Trade Center and the Pentagon, and uh, then came down and repeated essentially those remarks uh, later in the day for the uh, cameras. Uh, now, after uh, Commissioner Zaccardelli's uh, news conference, uh, they're saying that they don't anticipate anything else more tonight unless uh, that intelligence was wrong and Canada is a target and something else happens or something else happens in the United States. But at the moment, the RCMP and all of the federal agencies are uh, working with the Americans wherever they're asking for help. And uh, that is uh, what is going on at the moment. But, Peter, there doesn't seem to be, despite some heightened security around Ottawa and other cities in the country, there doesn't seem to be any great fear here that what happened today in the United States is likely to happen in Canada. You know, Don, it was very interesting watching the Commissioner's remarks because he was very careful how he handled uh, some questions. Uh, it was almost as interesting what he didn't say as to what he did say. Uh, questions like, was there any advice given to the Prime Minister that he should be uh, departing his uh, residence at 24 Sussex Drive and to be taken somewhere else? He said, we do not discuss the kind of advice that we give to the Prime Minister. Interesting, too. There's not really anywhere to take him, at least not around Ottawa. You remember, Peter, for years and years, there was what was called the Diefen Bunker. It was built during the Cold War, during the 1950s, when John Diefenbaker was Prime Minister. It's just west of the city, and it was the place that uh, the Prime Minister and senior government officials were meant to go in the event of a nuclear attack, in the event of a war. Uh, but uh, since the end of the Cold War, the Diefen Bunker has become a bit of a tourist site, but it's no longer operational, so it's not entirely clear where the Prime Minister would go if, uh, if there was somewhere uh, for him to go. Although uh, the suggestion was made also that it was easier to protect him at 24 Sussex Drive, although remember there was a break-in once at 24 Sussex Drive, but easier to protect him at 24 Sussex Drive than on Parliament Hill, and perhaps the Parliament buildings would be more likely to be a target than uh, the Prime Minister's residence. Tourists were uh, stopped going through the Parliament buildings this afternoon, but the buildings were uh, left open for people working there. Uh, the street in front of the Parliament buildings was closed. The block right in front of the Parliament buildings was closed for a while, and then it was reopened. And by and large, uh, things in Ottawa are more or less normal, except there are not a lot of people around because they're all, uh, like everybody, watching television to see 
just what is going on. All right, Don. Thanks very much, Don Newman, reporting to us uh, tonight from Ottawa. And of course, we'll be back to Don later as the evening uh, progresses. The latest update on uh, uh, George Bush's situation. He is on his way from Omaha to Washington at this hour. He's expected to land there uh, in another hour or so and to speak to the American nation. Uh, we're told at uh, 9 o'clock Eastern Time tonight, uh, although that may change to earlier depending on what time he arrives, uh, but it's expected either 8 or 9 o'clock tonight. As soon as we get a firm time on that, uh, we will let you know. George Bush to speak to the American people uh, as the American people still await more details of what the American government uh, knows about exactly what happened today and what it plans to do uh, in its response. Uh, the president and his spokespeople have been sounding very tough today that they will be a response, uh, a clear and uh, firm response when they know exactly what they are dealing with. Now, uh, this uh, situation in the United States being watched very closely, of course, in the Middle East, which has all of its own particular problems. Our Middle East correspondent is Neil McDonald. Neil. Peter, the mood here in Jerusalem, and I think it's safe to say in the Palestinian territories and elsewhere in the Arab world, is a somber one. There's a feeling here of great foreboding. If, and I say if, these attacks were perpetrated by Arab extremists, then Israel is inevitably drawn into the equation, as are the Palestinians and other Arab states. For the past year, especially since the election of President Bush, Israel and the United States of America have become synonymous in the mind of the Arab street. To a great many Arabs, both countries are now bitter enemies. And that explains some of the scenes we saw here today. In Arab East Jerusalem, groups of people took to the street, celebrating, toasting Osama bin Laden and generally hailing whomever managed to inflict such a lethal blow against Israel's closest ally and greatest protector. There were similar celebrations in the cities of the West Bank and in the Palestinian refugee camps of Lebanon. Most Arab leaders, though, understanding the sheer foolishness of taunting Americans at a time like this, were greatly restrained. First of all, I am offering my condolences, the condolences of uh, the Palestinian people to the, uh, to the American president, President Bush, to his government, to the American people for this terrible act. We are completely shocked. Completely shocked. Unbelievable. Palestinian extremist groups, though, issued cold denials and took the opportunity to lecture the United States. We are opposed to U.S. oppression, said this leader of Hamas, itself a group that has dispatched suicide bombers. We call upon the U.S. to take fair stands and not take Israel's side. Uh, we deny our responsibility, but we call upon the uh, American administration to review uh, their uh, attitude and their policy towards the Palestinian question, because this policy arouses the uh, anger and the hatred uh, of our people and of all uh, Arab and Islamic peoples. Israeli leaders universally expressed grief and condolences. Israel's foreign minister Shimon Peres says it pains Israel's heart and urged the world to organize against what he called terror, saying several countries are known to be terror centers and the world must not leave them free to play with people's lives. I hope the world understands today that its first enemy is Islamic terror, said Israel's defense minister. On the popular Israeli political program, Popolitika, an Israeli general called for the immediate liquidation of Yasser Arafat. And from a former prime minister... We here in Israel have been standing and fighting at the front line against terrorism for years, but now terrorism is struck at the heart of freedom. And this is exactly what this battle is. It's a battle between the forces of tyranny and terrorism and the forces of freedom and democracy. And that is doubtless how the Arabs of the Middle East fear the lines will be drawn from now on, with them cast irretrievably as terrorists and the word Islam synonymous with atrocity in the Western mind. It's probably fair to say that most people here, Arab and Jew, believe their lives changed today 
and that the geopolitical lines here have shifted radically. Certainly, the current Palestinian uprising with its overt Islamic dimension is going to be seen in quite a different light beginning tomorrow. Peter? Thanks, Neil. Neil MacDonald in Jerusalem. Well, from Jerusalem to London, where our Don Murray has been watching the rest of the world as it reacts to today's horror in the United States. Here's Don's report. The world watched transfixed. This was London. It could have been any major city in Europe this afternoon. Television pictures gathered crowds. They evoked curiosity, disbelief, and then horror. Traders were moved from the London Stock Exchange. They, too, watched the televised pictures in disbelief. Some left one of London's main financial office buildings. American firms sent their workers home. Rapidly, police forces around the continent were put on alert. Security was noticeably heavier at the American embassy in London. By the end of the afternoon, the impact was most obvious at airports. London's Heathrow was filled with passengers whose planes, headed for the US, had been turned back in the air. The chorus of condemnation from European political leaders was swift and unanimous. Germany's Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder talked of the revulsion his government and his country felt of these attacks. Russian President Vladimir Putin described the attacks as an evil blow against all civilized people. What happened today, he says, underlines the importance of Russia's proposal to unite all the forces of international society to fight terrorism. Britain's Prime Minister Tony Blair emerged from an emergency meeting of his senior ministers to say his country would stand shoulder to shoulder with the U.S. in a crusade to eliminate such earlier, attacks. This mass terrorism is the new evil in our world. The people who perpetrate it have no regard whatever for the sanctity or value of human life. And we, the democracies of the world, must come together to defeat it and eradicate it. This evening, NATO ambassadors met in Brussels just hours after all non-essential NATO employees had been sent home from the alliance's headquarters. Tomorrow, the European foreign ministers will meet in emergency session. But this furious round of diplomatic discussion barely conceals the obvious. No one in power on this side of the Atlantic has any real idea how this happened or what will happen next. Don Murray, CBC News, London. Don Murray in London and uh, summing up the dilemma now on the international scene and in some degree on the scene inside the White House tonight as decisions will have to be made about not only what happened about or also about what happens next. Well, to try and uh, help guide us on what we should be thinking in both those fronts, Barbara McDougall, former Canadian Minister for External Affairs, currently the president of the Canadian Institute for International Affairs. Ms. McDougall, I guess the temptation here is going to be to act swiftly, uh, once convinced with some degree of certainty as to who was responsible uh, for the actions that we've seen uh, that took place in both uh, Washington and New York today. Uh, that will be the temptation. Uh, how hard is it going to be to know with some degree of certainty who's responsible? I think it's going to be very hard for them to know. Although most terrorist organizations do have somebody with loose lips. So uh, sooner or later they will find out. And when they find out, uh, they will act uh, very swiftly. I mean, the Americans um, uh, don't take it this lightly, nor should they, nor should anyone else. You know, there's been uh, um, uh, discussion, uh, certainly among some academics in Canada that I've, uh, that I've heard over the last year or so, uh, who poo-poo who the, the uh, missile defense shield, but also um, American preoccupation with one or two terrorists in the world. And I think we've seen now that uh, uh, they had good reason to take these threats seriously. Is there the danger, though, of a rough rush to judgment here? I mean, you can already sense uh, coming out emanating from uh, different uh, officials in Washington on a uh, not for attribution basis, uh, pointing fingers directly at Osama bin Laden, who has been, uh, according to the Americans, uh, their enemy and targeting their uh, institutions for the last few years. His name is now being bandied about very uh, frequently, not on an official basis yet, but on a non-official basis. Is there uh, the danger of a rush to judgment here to try and find a villain in a hurry to re uh, respond to the kind of emotions that we're already seeing on the streets of America? 
There probably is the danger of a rush to judgment, uh, but I think overnight cooler heads will prevail. Uh, I think when Colin Powell gets home, um, he will have an impact on, on how the response uh, uh, is shaped and that uh, wiser heads will, will prevail. But uh, there's no question that, uh, that when they find out who does it, uh, who did it with any with any degree of of certainty they will move very quickly and uh, terrorism uh, terrorism is someone said a few minutes ago it is the evil of our of our century and uh, it can ma it can happen so quickly as we saw today uh, it can happen in a variety of ways. I think many of us have been holding our breath all day, waiting for the, uh, to see if there's another shoe that's going to tr drop. Mm -hmm. uh, is there going to be a round of bombs in buses? Um, obviously, you know, the, the airplane situation is at least temporarily under control because nothing is moving. But uh, there are a lot of other ways to uh, inflict death and destruction. Will there be another round? And I say that not to um, uh, create any kind of further panic, but I think there is this instinct among people to, to kind of hold a breath and wait and see what comes next. I'm interested in your comments about Colin Powell. He was in South America today. He's on his way back. He may well be the last person to get back to Washington simply for, because of the situation of distances. Uh, but the desire you have that he's in the room when the final decisions are made in all this, obviously I'm sure he's been on uh, any teleconferencing that Bush has been doing today. But is he a crucial part as far as you're concerned in terms of the kind of response that's taken now? Yes, in part because of his long military experience and uh, because of his uh, very real sense of what is going on in the world and his understanding of uh, uh, the political mood around the world in a way that maybe the others don't have. Um, I, I think the president has selected very good advisors, not all of them. Uh, have the kind of experience that uh, that we see in Colin Powell, or the kind of nuanced experience as well. Uh, certainly, Dick Cheney and uh, and Donald Rumsfeld are experienced, but they're they're pretty pretty inclined to be on the tough guy's side. I think I think this is a time for Colin Powell to step in and and really assert his authority and his moral authority with the president. All right, we're told now uh, with certainty that it's nine o'clock tonight that uh, George W. Bush will be speaking to the American nation and to the world as these things always uh, uh, happen that uh, signal will be going out around the world what uh, as a last point to you uh, Ms. McDougal would be the key points that you'd want to see uh, George Bush saying tonight um, uh, well we will hear him say and, uh, and he must say that he is there to protect the American people uh, and that he will take whatever steps are necessary to do that um, he will probably then go on to talk about some of those steps around the borders and uh, and uh, leaving no stone unturned. Um, I don't know that he can go a lot further than that unless they have information that uh, none of us are, are aware of and which it's unlikely they will have by, by 9 o'clock tonight. Uh, I think mostly it's important that Americans see their president, they see their leader um, visible and uh, uh, and and consulting with people and ensuring uh, them that he will take whatever action is necessary. Terrorism is uh, it's a phenomenon that does require a very forceful response. Terrorism does not respond well to turning the other cheek. Uh, it, it simply builds the confidence of terrorists if they think they can get away with it. So I think he will respond uh, with, uh, very um, strongly. Appreciate your insight on this. Barbara McDougall, former uh, Foreign Affairs Minister, External Affairs Minister in this country, presently the uh, President of the Canadian Institute of International Affairs, joining us here in Toronto. Thank you very much. Well, from Toronto, let's uh, go back out to Calgary. It's been a couple of hours since we uh, uh, had our discussion with Wilf Engel, a former American Airlines pilot who has been helping us from the pilot's perspective on all this today, uh, trying to get a sense of what uh, may have been happening in those final moments in the cockpits of the various aircraft that were hijacked today, two of which went into the uh, uh, twin towers of the International uh, Trade, the World Trade Center in uh, New York. Uh, it sounds like we may be having an audio problem here. Mr. Engel, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mr. Engel? Peter, if you can hear me, I can't hear you, but I will get back with you as soon as they can fix my problem okay, here. Okay, that's, uh, that's good. Well, Engel, uh, 
uh, calm in the uh, in the seat there, just as uh, I'm sure he was in many uh, flights as well, as he uh, hoping to get that uh, audio hooked back up again uh, with Calgary. Uh, uh, Will Fenger was uh, giving us his thoughts on on what might have been happening in those uh, final moments in the in the cockpits of the various aircraft that were hijacked today, and his concerns about uh, security measures. Obviously, uh, this now once again the uh, live shot in uh, New York City, the uh, continuing aftermath. Uh, keeping in mind that it's now been nine hours since the uh, first aircraft struck into the World Trade Center. Uh, an hour and a half later, both uh, towers were uh, lying on the ground in rubble. The smoke still pouring out of that area. Since there have been fires in neighboring buildings, the collapse of a 47-story building that was uh, adjacent to the World uh, uh, Trade Center, uh, hit by the debris of the uh, falling towers, uh, it collapsed uh, a little less than an hour ago. Uh, have we had any luck with Calgary yet? Can we hear? Uh, no, we're still working on that audio problem, and uh, that is unfortunate. Um, but there uh, we see the uh, horrific scene on the uh, southern end of the island of Manhattan. Much of it has been evacuated throughout this day. There have been uh, rescue officials trying to get to the area where the buildings crumbled into the ground. Uh, the problem is the uh, emergency crews say that the situation has been just too dangerous for many hours throughout today to get anywhere near the, uh, the rubble to work on any possible rescue attempts. Well, let's go back to Calgary. I think we uh, now have uh, hooked up with uh, Will Engel, who is uh, the former American Airlines pilot who's been helping us through today. More information since we last uh, uh, talked, uh, uh, Mr. Engel, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are now from what you've heard throughout the day, what you think uh, uh, happened in those uh, final minutes on board those aircraft. Well, my heart goes out to the crew members' families because, uh, you know, they've experienced a horrendous loss. And it's definitely a black, you know, black shield against, uh, over, over aviation today. I mean, we've never had any kind of disaster even to this magnitude even thought of. I mean, it, it just hasn't been a part of the thought process before today. And reading some of the accounts of what's been going on uh, with... Uh, various aircraft uh, this afternoon those getting low on fuel uh, how do we how do we report that to ATC how do we let people on the ground know uh, they had an incident up at uh, 747 up in the White Horse uh, they evidently had transponded 7700 the hijack code uh, and the Alaskan authorities picked that up and scrambled jets to the area they got the plane on the ground and uh, mass made confirmed it was just low on fuel but but that's one of the ways that you can get somebody's attention on the ground. You know, the only sense we've heard, a, a, a report from, uh, from someone who was talking to one of the flight attendants on board one of the aircraft that went into the uh, World Trade Center uh, on a cell phone at the last minute, was that the one thing she reported was that the hijackers uh, had stabbed a couple of the flight attendants and then stormed the flight deck. That, that Given sounds, that, yeah. what do you think happened? Okay, to kind of take you through a, a capsule of, of that segment, it's got to be it's got to be business as usual on takeoff because they can't alert the flight crew up in front. They can't, you know, they they've got to be able to do the takeoff, get in the air because on the ground, you know, if they find out before they've taken off, they're going to abort the takeoff. At this point, they've got to be business as usual. They get in the air, then they take over the aircraft. So you take out you you strategically place people on board the airplane and I think it had to be more than a couple because if you put someone in the front section of the aircraft to take care of the number one or the senior flight attendant in the front uh, first class first class section of the aircraft then you've got the rear or the aft galley the, those are the two stations that are most important on takeoff you got jump seats at both ends you got crew sitting at both ends of the aircraft so you've got to strategically place people to take those two people out but yet not alert the flight deck so once you take care of those two stations, on a 7.5 and a 7.6, both of them are strategically placed in the aircraft, uh, into the left rear and into the center of the rear. On the uh, 7.5 and on the 7.6, it's going to be mid-station. So once you get these two areas secure with terrorists, and they go in and they commandeer those two, two stations, and they've got to do it quickly. 
No, uh, you know, uh, Captain Engel, I'm going to have to interrupt you here right now, uh, as much as we appreciate okay. your sense of what may have been happening. We are looking now live at Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, which some have suggested may be home to Osama bin Laden, the terrorist that some are suggesting already uh, has been uh, responsible for uh, what we've witnessed today. There are explosions at this hour in Kabul, Afghanistan. It is into the middle of the night uh, in Afghanistan now. Just guessing here at about 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, there have been explosions reported in Kabul, uh, Afghanistan, or with these pictures coming from our uh, friends at uh, CNN. Still, details on that, uh, very unclear. These pictures, a mixture of uh, live and tape, but you see the, uh, well, that appears to be uh, uh, attempts at anti-aircraft fire, at uh, shots being fired into the air, but we are being told uh, from uh, CNN and other sources that there are explosions in Kabul, Afghanistan tonight. Whether this uh, and how it relates to uh, what we've been witnessing throughout this day, uh, we can't tell you with any certainty yet. We're on top of that story and we will be monitoring it uh, as the evening progresses. Is this the beginning of American retaliation for what happened today or is it something quite independent of what we've been witnessing all this day? This is going to be a long evening. Stay with us here. I'm Peter Mansbridge at the CBC. Any suggestions? Should we set up here for medical work?